Okay, so thank you very much for coming. Um, sort of the last session in this room anyway for today. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, how to take an SBOM and use it for AI applications because there's a few differences uh, that we need to include. I mean, the SBOM today is, is quite good, um, but when you build an AI application, there's a few differences that we need to be adding some additional fields. Um, but we are looking to, we've been doing surveys of some experts in the SBOM area as well as the AI area to make sure that we've got coverage. So if you're interested, we'll talk about it at the end of the talk as well, but we'd love for you to come and join our group. Um, so today, myself, oops, um, I'm Karen Bennett, and this is Kate. I think everybody knows Kate for SBOMs. Um, myself, my background is um, I used to be part of Red Hat, so I'm very familiar with open source. But for the last uh, 10 years, I've been building AI applications. And I, Kate and I uh, have worked together in the past, and I just approached her to say, hey, you, you know, your SBOMs are great, but they don't really cover all the things that I would like to capture as part of documenting our applications. So this is the result of that. Um, as you know, the world is changing. Um, AI is pretty, um, you know, mainstream. It's coming online with a lot of applications these days. Um, so it's fully in your supply chain. And I know there's been a lot of good talks about sort of cy cyber security in your, your supply chain. But AI, we'll get to it. Uh, I guess it's the next slide. Oh, maybe not. Um, so again, uh, this gives you, what's that? Just say next when you want me to advance it. <laughs> okay, go next. Go forward or stay back, go back? Uh, go forward. Okay. Is that the, yeah. So why does it matter? Um, AI is growing big time. Like it used to be, you know, when I started out in the AI space, the people were just doing it sort of in research and, you know, um, prototyping. But now it's pretty mainstream. Um, the big companies are using it for, um, I work with a lot of banks up in Canada, um, and they're using it for cybersecurity, fraud detection. I also work with companies like Amazon with the recommendation engines, but my primary focus of work that I do is on the uh, self-driving cars. So I work with three of the five manufacturers of cars, um, Ford, GM, and Mercedes-Benz. And, you know, people keep saying, oh, it's not here yet, but it's coming pretty fast. And one of the problems is, is especially if you're taking open source parts and combining it with proprietary stuff, um, having an SBOM or some way to document what you've got is going to become very, very important for our AI applications. So the next one. Um, according to some of the statistics out there, I mean, I've heard a lot about cybersecurity in the last couple of days, but most, and like 96% of this survey um, for cybersecurity is using AI and machine learning today. So it's already integrated in these apps. So we need to figure out how to document them. Um, and yep, I'll pass it over to yourself. Okay, so I'm just gonna give a quick intro about everyone sort of before the meeting started, sort of raised their hands roughly on about SBOMs. But what I'm talking about when I talk about SBOM is a formal record contain the details and supply chain relationships between components that are used for building software. And components could be source files, they could be libraries, they could be packages, they could be full distros. All of these are valid components and they could be proprietary, they could be free. This is all part of our software supply chain today. And so some of the work that happened in NTA was just to define a basic little supply chain. And there are things that are known and there are things that are unknown. And being very clear and explicit about, do I depend on this? Do I include it? What do I, do I know everything that's coming in or is there things that I just don't know? And being able to articulate that is at the heart of what is a minimum SBOM today. So we're finding that 
Um, transparency is going to be key to improving the software supply chain security and AI explainability. So we need to be able to document this effectively. So um, last year, the Linux Foundation did a survey, um, and you know, two of the main actions that came out of it were make sure you've got a vulnerability reporting system so you can track your vulnerabilities. Number two, use SBOMs. And so this survey was you know, global in nature, and this is sort of the advice that came back as to how we need to move forward. And the, as part of that, we were asking, OK, who are you using them today? Well, actually, 47% are using them today. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the challenge with the definition of what an SBOM is, because people are talking past each other a little bit still. And based on that survey, 78% said they'd be using them this year. So it's coming fast. And we'll have SBOMs there. However, we, it was, there's a missing piece of having this data and the AI aspect for documenting that we have to talk about. So applying the SBOM and AI to AI applications and training is one of our challenges. And yeah, so for those that have written AI applications, you probably already are aware of this. But um, the SBOM today is very good with the colored circles. But when you bring an AI application, it, it needs to be trained and the data is really key to the, your application on whether it's you know, going to have good predictions. So, it, so we're going to have to have a way to say, how did you clean the data? Like, how did you take you know, all the uh, empty cells or out of a spreadsheet that were of use? Did you get rid of um, duplicate records? That say, I heard a couple of people asking questions about s single identity. Like, these types of things, if you can get rid of and clean it, your AI application will actually be more, uh, be able to, accuracy will, will improve hugely. Um, the next one is, I mean, we talk about data again, but data, some percentage of your data that you're going to document, you ha use it for training purposes only. Then you have data that you use for testing, and then you have your live data that's in the outside world. So there's sort of that three levels that you're, we're in our SBOMs are going to have to be able to document. Um, the other is sort of the training of the model. So before you can go to production, you actually, we'll get to the next slide in a second and it sh shows it better, but you need to train your model with data. Sadly enough, um, for those, for the most part, I've written just sup supervised machine learning apps to date. Although uh, we're starting to experiment with unsupervised learning apps. And this, the computer is actually learning by itself. It no longer needs a human telling it what data to look at. So this will be a challenge for SBOMs in that we're going to have to somehow figure out how we're documenting that, you know, the data that an uh, AI application is actually using. The other thing with data is the whole idea of consent. So I'm sure folks have seen, you know, many articles on they didn't have consent to use my data. And right now in the world, you sort of have different views between, you know, what China consent, considers consent, what the EU does, and what sort of North America does. But again, think of um, a surveillance video or facial recognition. People are collecting your data, and you don't, you don't even get the opportunity to say whether you gave consent or not for that use. So again, how are we going to document that in an SBOM? It will need to be figured out. Um, the other couple of bullets. Um, so again, um, with an AI application, it's constantly the data is changing. Um, as I said, in the self-driving cars, we actually have sensors within the, the cab of the car that is monitoring your biometrics, your facial recognition, you know, your breathing, the temperature of the car. But this is constantly changing. And so that whole feedback of you had data that you started to do the training with, but it's actually, um, they call it, um, I'm sure many of you know, data drifting. So at what point 
do you flag the data drift and document that? So again, it's, it's a new challenge for SBOMs. And then the last one is again, sort of uh, models need to be tested, but uh, so the, a the application that we've been building is you deploy your model and your, your data that you're using, but when data changes, we actually have a mechanism that actually can change the model itself. So the code is constantly live. Again, a concept that um, I don't think SBOMs today are taking into consideration. So some, just some things to think about. So let me just repeat that because my instructions are for the folks on virtual. Um, the EU has a criteria with uh, their definition of models and the standards of the sort of high risk, low risk, uh, critical risk. Um, and would that be part of the bomb? As it turns out, we're going to show you that was one field that was flagged that we're going to have to, especially because the EU has already sort of made some uh, good roads in that direction. You're going to have to flag whether your app is high risk, uh, low risk, according to some definition of those, which it would make sense to start with the EU definition. So yes. Um, and as you're probably aware, facial recognition is critical risk. Um, so there's some, some individuals in, in the world that think you should ban those type of applications. Um, but at the minimum, you need to be documenting that you're a high risk application. So yes. Oh, wow. And, uh, Right. Actually, next time I'm going to hand the mic to the person asking. That's a great question. <laughs> um, it really is about, um, you were right, reinforced learning is constantly learning. What, from my opinion, um, I think SBOMs have to somehow document the ingredients of your product, but they also, or some way has to happen to uh, tell you the impact of, of your application, you know, whether you're high risk or low risk. I, I personally would like to see it included in the SBOM um, as part of sort of, there's only one place you have to go to understand. It might be as Kate was going to talk to in a minute, there's sort of your build of your uh, SBOM, and then there's the deploy of the SBOM. So it could be that there's different fields depending on what f uh, phase of development you are. So, so uh, um, again, um, so I work pretty heavily with IEEE. Um, in a lot of their AI ethical standards, as well as ISO, as well as I uh, work with the Chinese AI group, um, trying to understand a lot of, uh, you know, what are the rules that we should be applying uh, as part of, you know, an AI application. And interestingly enough, you know, I, I got tired of counting, but there's over 2,000 standards out there. So I don't know how anybody is following any of these. And then, you know, I've heard Kate repeat it in a couple of talks, but they're not free. I mean, the reason I joined IEEE was so I could get access to these. Um, the beauty that I've seen with Linux and with the SBOM, they're an ISO standard and they have figured out how to work the system so they can be free. So I think longer term, if we really want developers to follow these standards, we're, we're gonna have to figure out how to open this information so that people truly understand where the rules are. And interestingly enough, at least I'm heavily involved with the 
they call it the P7000 group of I, uh, IEEE, which is AI ethics. So it's what do you do about trans transparency, bias, um, emotional data. They are all putting a rule in there that you have to document your ingredients of your product. So that is a rule that's going to be coming out. A lot of these are still in development. They haven't hit the street quite yet. But again, I would encourage you to come and join some of these groups to, to mold it. And then the other thing that I've seen, because I do go to different um, companies and, and help or whatnot, is everybody has their own way of documenting. Like there's data sets, there's scorecards, there's fact sheets, there's, and what, to me, what SBOM it has the opportunity to do for an AI application is unify this so that we're all talking apples to apples instead of, oh, you know, on a data sheet, I specified this. Having been a developer, if I can't just have one place to go document, I, I probably won't document for you. I'd let somebody else document, you know, the, the product itself. So with that, and then again with a life ci cycle of, of sort of a machine learning app, um, there is a lot more sort of phases to how development is done. It's primarily around the data is where the differences are, but that whole monitoring once you're out, you know, you've deployed it is, is a feature that AI, um, developers need to be accounted for. And in fact, I've been talking to a number of the tools groups downstairs, um, trying to figure out how we can mo more automatically monitor when data crosses a threshold of some sort and it flags to a developer. Personally, I don't think it can be automated without a human yet, but um, at least having a, a human involved it, um, or get an alert of some sort when it, it you know, crosses some boundaries. And then for those that are, a, you know, build AI, it pretty much is, um, this comes from an IBM paper, but it, is, it has the data, the model, and then there's actually code associated with an AI application. So again, um, it's the mixture of all these three components. So when we go through the SBOM examples, you'll see that we need to have a package associated with, at least one package associated with each of these areas. Oh, and. So again, for those that have built AI applications, you're probably very familiar, but really what you have is your data, you have your, um, you know, your Python code. Um, we, so for the most part, um, we use a, a percentage of the data to train our model. So, you know, we would say 20% of, you know, the facial recognition in the, in the cab of the car is actually used to train the model. Um, and then you come out with your uh, objects that are going to be created to, to um, become the product itself. Oh, I'm still on. <laughs> Okay, so again, standards, I talked a bit about it, but if you, the standards associated with AI right now, they come in groupings of uh, sort of what's ethical and what's the rules that you're going to pay a penalty or go to jail. There isn't so much on this side yet. I mean, I think everybody in this room is familiar with GDPR and the fines. I mean, that's definitely sort of the law, but the standard space gets even more complicated. So you have your global sort of standards, um, you know, like the SBOM. Then you have your regionals where Europe is quite different than um, say I'm from Canada, like our data privacy uh, laws or, or guidelines are quite different than the states. Um, and so you've got the regional level and then you actually have what I call domain level standards. So again, being in the car 
industry, you have to behave with the traffic rules. So if a red light says stop, that self-driving car has to stop. Like it actually has rules that it has to abide. And so figuring out which standards you have to adhere to, comply to, is going to get more mucky as we produce uh, products in this area. So again, the SBOM has a great, um, will be a great aid for many of us as developers to figure out, okay, what standards um, do we, are you following? And, uh, you know, I can look at your SBOM and say, hey, you, f you know, you're not following GDPR and you're going to sh ship in, in Europe type thing. Um, so that is another field that we're proposing that you actually have to document what standards you're following. Oh, I'm still up. Okay, so one of the things that we're going to go through is we picked um, an open source project out on the internet. Um, so MIT has a, a simulator model that simulates uh, self-driving cars. Um, and then we used uh, the, the Waymo data sets that are out there as an example of how we might document um, an SBOM. Uh, one of the exercises that we're doing with the working group right now is we have, um, okay, we'll go through it, but we have a, a list of fields that we think are good enough to be the minimum viable sort of documentation that you would do as part of an SBOM for an AI app. And then we have a, a longer list of uh, fields that we think you should document, um, but, you know, it's more optional. Um, and... So we'll go through the example of, of these two things. So just at a top level, the MIT simulator, I wasn't actually familiar with it because more the car manufacturers have their own proprietary systems. But, you know, one of the things, and it will be debatable about potentially saying what type of algorithm are you using in the model, like the decision tree regression. Um, is what the MIT simulator uses. Some folks think that's proprietary, but the good news with SBOMs is you have this no assert. So if I don't want to document it, I don't have to. But on the flip side, it, as an internal documentation, I probably would want to document that so that my new hires were at least familiar with all the ingredients of, of the, the product. And then with the Waymo, um, so we'll talk about it in a minute, but um, again, they have two data files, so we're going to propose that there's a package, an SBOM package, and then you can go down to the file level to know the specifics of what's in the file. But the licensing for Waymo is something I've never seen before, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Talking a bit about adding this type of AI information to our SBOMs, one of the key um, features we need to keep in mind is that there's a software life cycle out there and there's a data life cycle out there. And in the, within the software life cycle, we have different types of SBOMs occurring out there in the wild and people talk past each other all the time. So by being explicit about the type of SBOM, we can help tease apart some of the misunderstanding and make the conversations more productive. In the security space, for a large part, they're talking about a build SBOM, where they're basically looking at the dependencies that have been built together and so forth. But there's also a source SBOM, which is the sources. And so the build SBOM depends on the source SBOM to some extent, because you need to know your sources and what's made it into your binary and what's in your final executable image. Also out there, though, is something like an analyzed or binary analyzed SBOM, where someone's given a, a, a random blob from a third party and it tries to figure out, are there risk of using it? Is there dependencies? And so that you would not necessarily, it'd be the same sort of thing that would come out of a build SBOM, but it's, you don't have the information. So you use heuristics to try to find it. So like a built SBOM would have a lot more confidence in use than an analyzed one, for instance. But both are, like all those are there. And then there's, 
quite frankly, the deployed SBOM. So what configurations have you deployed your system with? And so when we're talking about those loops of learning with the data, that's all going to happen and be potentially documented in a deployed SBOM, where it potentially refers back to built SBOMs and then data that has changed over time. So these are sort of the, um, how should I put it? These are sort of the working definitions we're trying to get clarified with some consensus in the industry. But I think it's important to understand what part of a software life cycle has someone built the, has the SBOM come from and what is the expectations around it? So, because there's different tooling in all places as well. And so that is a factor and there'll have to be more tooling potentially as well when we start adding in the data and the AI learning sides of it. Most of it I think is gonna come in the deployed SBOM and that's probably the least well-defined part of this life cycle today. And so we have an opportunity to make sure we build data in right from the start there too. So when we talk about building up that model, we'll have a source package. And you know, this here is effectively a source SBOM, okay? And there's source files and there may be depending on libraries and that may be linked, you know, all that stuff may be coming out. Like it'd be a source SBOM for the Linux kernel, all the files in the Linux kernel. Um, but here, the model image would be generated from some sort of sources. And as you build up the model, it's having executable, so you'll have a build SBOM that has where it's generated from and then what it depends on from runtime libraries. Some may be static, some may be dynamic. And then as you build up an AI application, you've got your source SBOM for the AI application and you've got your executable and it's been generated from those sources and it may be depending on that trained model to really run. So you see these different types of um, SBOMs have potentially different types of information associated with them. But the structures all work for them. And if you're building up your model, it's coming out from a source. There's some source behind that model as well. And when you deploy an application, okay, um, you know, you have that application, it's, it's generated from the sources, it depends on your trained model, and it has a runtime dependency of the runtime data coming into it. SPDX today can represent most of this, in fact, but the trained model and the trained data is um, one of the areas where we need to extend things a little bit. And so we really don't have, you know, we have an original model, we have the notion of training data going into it, we have validation going into the trained mo train data model, and we don't have the relationships. So there will be relationships introduced to let us express these concepts as well as start to articulate it. So looking at examples will let us figure out what is a reasonable set to work from. And so what we're doing in the SPDX AI ML group is um, basically doing a survey of existing sources of documentation to Karen's definition. And so um, Gopi, who's here with us as well, has been doing a lot of surveying of the industry, well, all the industry standards and work we've been sort of pulling this together on our weekly meetings and trying to understand what the common denominators are and what the variances are. And what we've done is taken those, what these documentations are looking for, mapping them to existing SPDX fields, and then seeing where the gaps are. So it's a basic gap analysis exercise. And then what we're trying to do is figure out, okay, what's required initially and what is optional? And what do we want to do as our first set going out? And so, you know, some of the gaps we've been sort of seeing, and we've, Karen was talking about in the AIML and the model part of it, the standards compliance. Now I've already seen um, ARM automatically document in standards into SPDX using the comment field, so an extension point effectively. So they want standards as well. So that's very likely to be going in um, going forward. Some of the risk assessments, autonomy, limitations, type of model, domain, information about training, information about the application, hyperparameters, metrics, metrics decision thresholds, and is the model explainable? and energy consumption are all areas we really don't have a good match to right now in SPDX. So we'll be defining fields to capture this type of information. And it will not, be, not all of it will be mandatory. A lot of it will be optional. Just so that if you want to capture it somewhere, you have a place to capture it to share with someone. And then on the data set side, so there's effectively two profiles. There's an AIML, one for an application, and then there's a data set profile. And with the data set, 
there's certain things like, you know, how was it collected? What's its intended use? The size? What the noise levels are? These are all things that are captured in these other documentation mechanisms today. Again, standards are important here. <laughs> um, known biases. Um, you know, is there sensitive personal information? We sort of, after a lot of discussion in a couple of meetings, we called that out explicitly. And has there been any anonymization used? Is there any confidentiality considerations that have to be thought of? Um, supplier, some of the errata, and some of the, you know, data set update mechanisms. How do we actually take this and iterate on it to update? So this type of information are things we need to start working through examples and then deciding what's the first issue we're going to have and which of these fields are we going to pull into a data set profile as options. So what's going on right now is um, the SPDX community has been um, working on the 3.0 model for the specification. And we've got a formal model underneath it. And we're starting to work on the serializations. But you'll see here on the bottom, there's various working groups. <laughs> and so the legal working group has been focusing on re re you know, updating the licensing considerations and the fields available for licensing. The defects is working on the security information. Um, the build profile is working on um, what information do we want to capture from that build stages? And what evidence do we might capture from the build stages of that cyclone? Because um, that's important for supply chains, because the build tools are important in the, in the supply chain as well. And so there's work going on there. Um, the Japanese are working very much on the usage profile. What's important to capture when it's used? When does it go out of service? When does it expire? We actually introduced a few more fields in 2.3 last month. Um, basically, um, build date, release date, and valid until, so that we can start to actually capture end of life and risk in policies, and we can actually use that information for managing our software that is in the system and have indicators. Because certain open source projects, for instance, will say the community will support it till this period of time, but then after that, who's supporting it, right? And so if you hit the end of life of, uh, from a community's perspective, and it, it may change and you may want to update it and you may have to regenerate it, but you have a, something in your system to force a inspection or look. And so the, the um, Open Chain Japan team really wanted those fields and so we've brought them in early and we'll be using them extensively in the AI profile as well. Um, and then we have our AI working group which is actually turning into two profiles, a data set profile. <laughs> and so um, you know, Gopi is going to be talking about op open datology tomorrow. And they're, they're, we're going to be using that, some of the work with them to hopefully pilot some of this stuff. And um, obviously the AI applications. And if there's things that people want to represent and don't know how, we can start discussions on other profiles as well. But this is what we're sort of our scope is right now. And what's ready when 3.0 is ready to put out for the core? We'll go in, and the next we'll go into 3.1. <laughs> so we won't block on these profiles, but we will be working our thoughts in that direction with trying an attempt to intersect. So I'll turn it back over to Karen to talk about Waymo. Okay, so the Waymo data set, um, so I manually tried because I'm, I'm not an SPDX person yet. Um, I, I think it's a great tool. I was downstairs talking with lots of people about it. But really what, uh, you know, as you document your data set, uh, these are the key features um, that you're going to, that you do today on your software packages. So it's not really too much different. The only thing that is different, let me just, um, so, um, it sort of starts from down here. Uh, although before I go there, uh, this is partly, you know, uh, Kate mentioned Gopi is doing a session tomorrow, but one of the things we realize that the licenses for data are not that consistent. Um, you have companies coming out with their own sort of special license. And if you go, you have to, you know, go and read it, basically their data set cannot be used for commercial use. 
You know, it brings me back to the days when we were trying to define LGPL. And it's just like, no, no, open source means it has to, can be used by everybody, in my opinion. Um, but at least they are flagging uh, up front that that data set. But what Gropi's going to try and do is get, you know, a common list of, of data license uh, is out there so that maybe people will now go look at those before they define their own. Okay. Um, but these are basically some new things that we're talking about. So especially in the area of emotional or empathetic type data, the whole how you calibrated the sensors, what sensors did you use, all of this type of thing needs to come in with um, your data set uh, longer term to document. So we'll go to the next one because we are running out of time. So interested in getting <laughs> involved. So this is a newly formed group. I think we've, how long have we been? Like less than six months. Um, but what we're uh, doing, and Gopi's been sort of the lead on this, is ex if you're not able to attend the working group meetings, we're trying to do these surveys where we ask you, do we have all the fields that make sense to you? Um, or, you know, are there more gap ones so that we can start to document those? Um, so feel free to come in as a participant as part of the survey. Or we have a weekly meeting on Wednesdays. Um, but the one area that we're in right now is we're taking um, use cases and running them through to see. Uh, we have a number of people doing this. Um, and one of the groups is Hugging Face, because they do a lot of open source. Um, but go through the exercise. Hopefully, we get tools coming out soon that includes all these fields. But um, do the exercise. Do we have all the fields, et cetera? Um, the more use cases, the better. Um, and then, yeah, come join us, and it, that's our AI. But let me just do a cell on the next slide a little bit. So again, as I said, I'm associated with IEEE as well as doing, that's my night job. Um, but we have created, we got some money from IEEE and the EU Commission. One of the problems with AI or out there, especially in the, the standards group area, is there's no common definition of what all these words mean. So they've actually funded a small group of us to go do literature searches of all the standards that are in this space and also uh, figure out all the, the definitions that are out there with the hope that longer term we can consolidate and unify on definitions because before you know we're going to be able to automate a lot of this we all need to be talking the same language um, yeah so we're basically taking it so this website is being focused at what does a developer need to know and do and rules for um, building an AI application, and then it's quite different if you're regulating or auditing. I mean, myself, I audit a lot of uh, AI applications, and sort of the claim to fame is, um, I don't know how many folks know Clearview out there, but it's, it's um, a lot of the police forces are using it to recognize, you know, whether you're a criminal or not. So you're, you know, crossing the border and it flags. The first thing um, I asked was, what's your accuracy? And they told me 6%. And I went, what? And it, it, being a software developer, I was like, no, 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 that can't be. And they were like, trust us. It's good enough. It gets most of the criminals off the street. And I was like, wow, this is a new world that we're coming across that uh, us as software developers are not used to sort of that lower standards for some of, uh, you know, the uh, information that you have. So that's where the regulation uh, sort of section is coming in, is really looking at their landscape and how they police these applications. So with that, uh, we only have a few seconds for questions. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, sorry. Okay. 
So is one of the goals of this uh, kind of binary reproducibility of your uh, kind of deployed machine learning? Yes. yes. Very much so. What tooling is there out there for generating AI specific case balls? Because those are a bit different than the others. Do you want that one? Right now, there's not much because we don't have them into the specifications and the standards. So the first step is to agree on the fields. And then the next step is once they're there and agreed on, we can start to encourage tooling to be produced. So there's some prototype work that's going on, but there's nothing I would basically point anyone at today. And anyone who wants to contribute tools and help with the prototyping work is more than welcome. Any other questions? OK, go for it. You showed several different test bombs uh, for AI, and if they need to be represented in a single document, is there a way that one can easily, in a machine readable way, understand which belongs to it? Yeah, so the S bomb format, at least on SPDX, has a lot of checks for authentication and ability to link from one document to the other, and elements in one document refer to the others. There, uh, Ivana from VMware was talking. Oh, you're Vana. OK, fine. You've got your tool. So you've got the tool that's doing it. And so you're as close as it's getting right now. It's going to become on the sources. And like I say, we're going to have to, I think it's easy enough to merge it. It's going to be splitting it apart that's going to be the challenge. <laughs> Um, and figuring out how, what logical partitions are. However, software is an ecosystem play, right? And you want to have that granularity of ecosystem information because it's going to change at potentially different rates at different times. So having one S-bomb all the time for the top level may not be effective. And so being able to you know, pull things together when you need to, and then quite frankly doing filtering on the S-bomb in terms of what you export out, these sorts of tools will be, I think, emerging into the into the software ecosystem because it could be needed. Because some of these things, like, you know, I um, was talking with uh, William Bartholomew at Microsoft and, like, you know, um, the Windows um, S bomb is, I think, what, 30 meg? Something, you know, 30 gigs, sorry, like that. Something like, it was a huge number and it really sort of like, yeah, okay. And so cutting down the size, getting it effective, figuring out what the, what's important, how many levels of dependencies you want to track down and represent consistently. Do you want to have everything or not? There's going to be different purposes, and so we're going to need to adjust the tooling for working with these types of artifacts. But you're going to get a lot more knowledge out of the art, these artifacts than you would with the um, trying to man go into the sources directly and work it from that way. And thank you very much. I got the stop signal. <laughs>